Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, you probably noticed if you're following along in our devotional books that uh, it was the last book for Ephesians uh, this last week. And so next week we'll be going into Philippians. There are devotional books on the table. Again, if we ever run out or if you need more, let me know. I can easily make more up for you and run it out to you so that way you have it. From October until March each year, I pull out my bag full of hockey equipment and I leave it in my porch because I normally play about once a week down at the rink in Cadillac. Now I play at my own home rink, but I don't put all my pads on when I'm at home. But when I am playing in Cadillac, I put all of my equipment on. There's elbow pads, and there's uh, what's called breathers or shorts that are padded, and there's knee pads, and uh, mask, and gloves to keep me protected. Because there are two things, hockey pucks and sticks, that when they hit you, they hurt. And the more padding you have, the better it is. So I, whenever I play in Cadillac, I make sure that I have the proper armor on to be able to get out there and enjoy the game to its fullest. Well, we're going to talk this morning about the armor of God and putting on the correct armor. That's where we see Roman numeral number one, that we need to put on the armor of God. Now in those days it would have been very common for them to see and understand the armor that a Roman soldier would use. In fact, I can imagine that as Paul was writing to the Ephesians and he's kind of writing his letter deciding what he wants to say, that he looks up and he sees a Roman soldier there because he's in jail. Paul is in jail and he sees a guard and he sees the equipment and the outfit the soldier's wearing and I can picture his mind start to work and think that would be a great illustration. And as he's looking at this soldier in front of him, he's writing this down. I don't know if he's actually staring at one when he wrote it down, but I could imagine that could be the case. But as he begins this, what he wants us to understand is that the strength we have in our Christian life is not external strength, but it comes from God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. He tells us here to be strong in the Lord. This is not a new concept. Over and over the Israelites were told to be strong in the Lord. And here he describes that we have the access to the strength of His might. We have the power of God living inside of us as believers to boldly declare the truth, to boldly stand against our enemy, to boldly be strong. But the power is not in and of ourselves. We are not a bunch of religious people trying to do a bunch of religious acts and somehow mustering the strength to be able to do that. He tells us what you need to do is be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. That God will give us the power that we need. What do we need this power for? Well, he tells us here in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, we need to be strong because our enemy wants to deceive us. Now, I've mentioned this before. I don't believe that Um, Satan is in our minds. I don't think that's the case. Scripture doesn't talk about that. I know from Scripture that Satan is not everywhere at once. Satan can only be at one spot. I was talking with a man today and uh, this week, and 
he said, I had to correct my daughter a little bit because she has a two-year-old that's having a hard time obeying. And the mom said, well, it just seems like, like Satan's trying to get him to disobey me all the time. And the dad kind of laughed. He says, well, that's probably not Satan because there's only one Satan running the earth, and why would he be wasting his time on a two-year-old toddler trying to get him to disobey his mom and dad? He says, that's the natural flesh. That is our flesh is born in natural disobedience. Now we do understand that Satan is powerful and real. He talks about here the schemes of the devil. But what Satan does is Satan sets up the world system to be full of deceit. To want to trick people into believing a lie. Or believing multiple lies. Think of what Satan did in the Garden of Eden. Has God really said this? This is something we've seen in our society today. Oh, does God really say that homosexuality is wrong? Churches all over are starting to accept, not only accept, but starting to embrace the homosexual movement. Because that's what the world is doing, and Satan is wanting to deceive people even the fact that I see this happen in younger Christians where we can say Scripture says this is wrong and they're trying everything they can to try to make excuses that somehow Scripture doesn't say it's wrong. They will come up with all these thoughts and ideas because the world and Satan behind it is trying to deceive, especially believers, because if we start giving in on certain parts of the scripture and saying, well, maybe it didn't really mean that. And then we say, well, it might not have meant this, it might not have meant that. The fact is, just because somebody wants to do it and wants to think it's okay, doesn't mean it's okay. And Satan sets up the world system to deceive. But that's an area that many of us, especially an older generation, would say, I don't understand that. But there are things that Satan will do for us to try to get us to think differently than what God thinks. And it says what we need to do is put on this armor of God so that we will not easily be deceived by the enemy. Easily deceived by the system of the world that he set up. And we need to understand that our enemy is a spiritual enemy. We are not in a physical battle on this earth. Verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, I don't believe this is a call to, to go out and to fight Satan everywhere. I, I have some uh, people that I've met, and they believe that Satan's hiding behind every bush. And so everything, everything in the world, it's all this spirit world, it's all there. there. There's demons everywhere. Now, I believe there are demons around, and I believe they're actively working. But here he says, look, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against the government. Our battle is not against the, the gay and lesbian movement. Our battle is not against those who are supportive of killing babies or killing elderly person. That's not where our battle is as Christians. Now, should we take a stand for life? Yes. Yeah. Should we take a, take a stand for righteousness? Yes. But we're not out there and called to go to physically fight. But what we are called to do is to understand that our battle is against rulers of the darkness of this world. But he's emphasizing we're not necessarily on the offensive. Almost everything talked about in the armor of God is defensive. We're out there and we want ourselves to be protected because God is working through us. And in order for God to work through us, we need to be that tool that is able to be pure and holy and effective witness for Christ. 
to the enemies out there trying to hurt us, trying to tear us down, trying to pull us apart, to set things up, to draw our minds away from Christ. We see that our ability to stand firm comes from our choices. So we are given choices is what Paul's relating here. Verse 13. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Notice he doesn't say, take up the armor of God that you can go out and you can attack and slay Satan. No. He says, take on the whole armor of God so that you can stand firm in the day. This is the idea of a protective battle. Satan is coming for you. Again, not directly Satan himself, but he sets up the world system. He wants to destroy believers. Why? Because if your life is destroyed, if you are revealed to be, uh, uh, talk about religion, but yet live like the world, you have become a hypocrite in the eyes of many, and you tear many away from Christ. He wants to destroy your spiritual life. That's why we need to put on the armor of God to stand against these attacks. All of us know people who at one time were active, involved followers of Christ, but yet have given in to the temptations of Satan, have fallen in to the things of this world. And it reminds us we need to protect ourselves against this because there, we have a powerful enemy and we have weak flesh. We see Roman numeral number two that we need to make it a habit to put on the armor of God. Now armor is just an illustration. He's trying to help us to understand. He's trying to illustrate something to see, to really give uh, the best relation, to, to help grasp this truth. And he gives several different things. The first one, he says, that we need to put on the belt of truth. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth. In those days, they wore belts not to keep their pants up because they didn't wear pants like we do today. But they had belts in order to tuck in their extra clothing that they would have. Many times they would have a tunic. They would have an extra garment that they would have that would kind of hang down almost like a cloth or robe that you'd hang around. And normally that would probably be down or hanging, but when you go into battle, they would tuck that in the belt because they didn't want anything hindering them or getting in their way when they were fighting. So they would tuck that in. He says here, put on the belt of truth. The idea of truth here isn't just telling the truth, which is important to tell the truth. And to James, James says, above all, let your yes be yes and no be no. Jesus says that as well. But here it has more of the idea of a truthfulness. Not living a life of hypocrisy where we have all these sins hanging off us, entangling us. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so easily clings to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Here, the author of Hebrews gives a running illustration. Let's take off the weight and sin which easily takes us down. When a runner was going to run, they're not going to run with their big baggy clothing on if they're running for a race. They take that off and they streamline as much as they can. Going back to the illustration of the armor, it is this belt of truth. You tuck in all the extra things. You live a truthful life. Not just telling the truth, but living out a life 
of truthfulness. I'm not going to be one thing at church and another thing at home. One thing at workplace and another person at home. I am going to live a consistent life putting aside these things, tucking in these things, putting them off that are going to hinder me from my Christian life. These things that sometimes are baggage that we carry with us. You hear, hear that term a lot now when, when uh, a relationship gets together and they say, I'm carrying a lot of baggage with me from things of the past. Sometimes Christians tend to carry baggage because we're, we're not willing to get rid of things from our past. Sinful things, harmful things, hurtful things. So he says that we need to put on the belt of truth. The next thing he says is we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. So having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now I think we've all seen this in Roman soldier, Roman armor, that they would have a breastplate that would protect their vital organs, specifically their heart and lungs, often made out of solid plate of metal. Sometimes it was like chain mail that they would have. They had this breastplate, and here he describes as righteousness. This has the idea when living a righteous life, a desire to be right before God. Not just a desire to, okay, I don't want a lot of sin in my life, but really a desire, I want to live right before God. I want to act, and I want to live out righteousness protecting our hearts from the attacks of the enemy. Then we need to put on the shoes of the gospel. Verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now when I was a, a child, I often heard this as the idea of the, the shoes ready to go and to share the gospel. That is part of it, but here it's the idea of the shoes were like cleats. And the idea of cleats, they help you stand firm. I don't do it much anymore, and sometimes uh, I want to do it, and then I go out and do it and realize that maybe I shouldn't do it, and that's playing football. I love playing football. I've always loved doing it. Um, I did a little bit this week in, in camp, um, and uh, I, was, it was, I was still not feeling well. It was Monday night, so I only played a little bit. But uh, when I play football, especially like on a grassy field, I always wanted to play with cleats on because I like to run, and I always like to cut. So you're running fast one way, and all of a sudden you stop, and you try to go the other way. Well, when you just have tennis shoes on, and all of a sudden you're trying to cut and stop, normally what happens, your foot just slides right out. And having those cleats, you dig in and you're able to cut and move and to stand firm. And that's the picture here of the shoes. Many times their shoes would actually have cleats on the bottom. So when they were fighting in muddy or wet fields, that they could have that firm stance. Now, yes, I believe we should go out and share the gospel with others, but the understanding here is more of a, a mental understanding of what the gospel is. I want to stand firm understanding the gospel. Well, what do I mean by that? Look at the verse that will be on your screen here in Romans chapter 12. It says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. It's a picture here of Satan being an accuser of the brothers. And I picture this as the enemy constantly trying to tell us we are not worthy to be followers of Jesus Christ. We're, a, we're sinners. Who are you to try to tell somebody how to live? You know what's happened in your life. You know the type of person you are. You know what your heart is. You're not a good person. You're not really a believer. Look at the way you live. 
when we understand the gospel. The gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ loved us in spite of our sins. We talked about this in the book of Ephesians, that we were dead, we were enemies of the cross of Christ, but God in His great love, by grace we've been saved through faith, He's told us in Ephesians. And when we understand the gospel, that I am just a sinner saved by grace, when our accuser comes, and who are you to tell somebody about Jesus? You're not a good person. You got this, you got this flaw, you got this going on. That we can be confident and bold because we've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not our own doing. It's not our own strength to truly understand the gospel. I am not worthy because of my outward actions, my outward works. I am worthy before God because of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who live defeated lives because of problems from the past. Because of sin even in the present that this, or temptations that are being battled. But when we understand the gospel that says God loves me no matter what, even when I fall, that's like having cleats on our feet that we can stand firm. Yes, we're sinners. Yes, we make a mistake. Are we worthy? Not one bit. Not one of us is worthy of the love of Jesus Christ. But he chooses to love us. That's part of the core of the gospel, that we can understand that even when we mess up, that we have the forgiveness of God, and we can stand firm. You see, our enemy wants to kind of convince us, oh yeah, you're no good. Who's going to listen to you? Who's going to want to be like you? Who's going to want to have what you have? Think of that, all the things you've done in the past. And we don't have to worry about that. That's the accuser. But we can stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus knows all of that about me. And yet he chose to love me. He chose to die for me. He chose to save me. Then we also see that we need to take up the shield of faith. In all circumstances, verse 16, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Many times the shields they would carry in those days, the Roman soldiers would carry shields that were about four foot high that would protect the whole body. They were often covered with some type of oily leather to, to protect it. Uh, these shields, but a certain type of oil that wouldn't light on fire. It was a certain type of protectant that would put out these fiery darts that would be sent to protect them from the enemy. And it says here, take on the shield of faith. Faith is a trust in God, a belief in God, that God will do what he says. Again, we go back to the Garden of Eden, and when Satan attacked, what did he say? Did God really say, or will God really do this? One of the great protections we can have is faith, to say, I'm going to believe in God. Now, it's easy to believe in God when things are going well. When everything's going great, it's really easy. Oh, man, God's a great God. He's wonderful. But when you're going through hard times, When you have a medical issue that you're battling with, when you've lost a loved one, when your relationships are falling apart, when financially you've been hurt, you're struggling, and it seems to go on and on and on. It's easy to start to, start to question, is God real? Is he really there? Does he really exist? And I'll be honest with you, I think everybody at some times questions their faith in God. Questions a belief. Am I really believing the right thing? Is the word of God really truth? But yet when we hold fast, when we understand, I'm going to stand strong and I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith even when this situation seems impossible. It helps protect us from the attack of the enemy. 
You see, when we take off that shield, when we start to question and doubt, does God really love me? Does God really care about me? Is God's word really true? What we're doing is we're starting to move that shield off here, and we're opening ourselves up to the attacks of Satan. But when we come with confidence and boldness that God's word is true, that God is faithful, that I can trust and I can count on God, when we live that life of faith, it keeps us from the attacks of the enemy. And then we see letter E, that we need to put on the helmet of salvation. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. I think this is similar to that idea of the gospel is to protect our minds. When I play hockey, one of the, uh, the equipment that I always wear with me now is I not only wear a helmet, you're required to wear a helmet, but you're not always required to wear a face mask in most places. Well, if you've ever tried to do something and you have this cage in front of your face and you have all these bars in front of your face and you're trying to see a puck and move around, it's not necessarily the most enjoyable. So a few times I thought, well, let me take off this mask. So I take off the cage. And as soon as I do that, it seems like the first time I take that off, I end up with like a bloody lip. Uh, maybe I should put the cage back on. I haven't taken the cage off for years because I've learned my lesson. I ended up with a bloody lip and thought, no big deal. Of course, I, it was a Saturday night once I was playing, and then the next day I had to preach on Sunday, and I got this big, you know, bulging lip. It was a little harder to do that. And so I thought, well, I'll put the cage back on. I did for a while, and then it was really bothering me. And so I took it off again another night for one night. And what happens? I get a stick that Right here, just had to go get stitches. Ah, forget it. I learned I do not play without a face mask on now because not that I value my face. I really don't value my face that much. Because I always tell my wife when she says something about the way I look, I said, I only have to look in the mirror once a day, if that. You are the one who has to look at me all the time. So uh, that's, she values that my looks a lot more than I value my own looks. The reason I wear a face mask is because I hate having to pay the money at the doctor. That's what I hate for. Uh, after having to pay 700 bucks at that time for stitches, now it would probably be $2,000 to get stitches. I don't want to do that anymore. So I wear that face mask. I protect it. Here he says, Take, uh, put on that helmet of salvation. Again, it's that understanding that I am saved from sin. It's a mental capacity. I am saved. I don't have to be involved in that sin. And I'm saved from sin. I'm saved to live in righteousness. And to go with that confidence in our mind, protecting our mind, to say this is what Jesus Christ did for me. I am saved. And to constantly remember that. That's one of the reasons why do we do communion once a month. That Jesus instituted that. It is to remember that we have been saved. We keep that on the forefront, protecting our minds. And then he says that we need to have the sword of the Spirit. He says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When Satan came to Jesus to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, what did Jesus use to rebuff the temptations of Satan? He used the word of God every time. Scripture has said, he declares. This is what scripture says. If you want to be able to fend off the attacks of the enemy, you need to know what the word of God says and be ready to use it. Many people that fall away from the Lord are religious people but don't really know what the whole word of God has to say. And it's very important to have the Word of God to be the source and the foundation. Then also we see finally he says that we need to cover ourselves with prayer. Verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end that we keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. He gives this illustration of prayer as like being alert at all times is we need the power of prayer. 
part of our weapon. It's not this physical weapon. It is the spiritual weapon because it is our spiritual power and ability that we have that gives us victory over the temptations of the enemy. Even Paul himself, what does he say? Verse 19, And also for me that my words may be given to my opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, cover everything in prayer. Now these are things that we need to constantly put on. And in conclusion, I just ask yourself this simple question. Are you regularly putting on the armor of God? Now I'm not talking about physically. But it, it, is it a pattern in your life to focus on your faith, to understand your salvation, to use the Word of God, to cover yourself in prayer. Most of us, if I were to ask you, do you want to be a faithful believer and be faithful to the end? Probably every one of us would say yes. But yet I've seen over and over that people, even people that have been believers for 30, 40 years, fall away even in the later parts of their life. Why? Because they become complacent in their spiritual lives. They've opened themselves up to the attack of the enemy because they're not putting on the armor. Again, it's, a, it's a, not a physical putting on of this armor, but it's the idea of increasing these things in our life, making these things part of our life in order that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. Before we sing our closing song, I just want to challenge you to think about the truth of God's word that's given here this morning and let it speak to your heart.